So there were three stages to this, uh, to what I'm calling the final judgment of the world. And I've covered this in a lot of detail back in 2017, and I haven't got time to do that tonight, but you'll see the relevance to these three stages, I think, when we start looking at Ukraine. Hopefully we will at some point look at that. Um, so stage one and stage two and stage three are three very separate, independent things that happen all in relation to Israel, and all part of the final judgment of the world. I think what we've tended to do as Chris Dalkins is lump the whole, all three together and try and squidge it together. And I don't think they are squidged together. I think they're three distinct parts. And stage one, I believe, is what I call it the inner ring war around Israel. And Israel's immediate neighbors make war against Israel. And this is still to come. And it's mentioned in Isaiah, uh, 17, Psalm 83, and Zechariah 12. And Psalm 83 says that there's, there's 10 tribes, and all of those tribes immediately surround Israel. There's an inner ring war, and Israel wins this war. Zechariah 12 says that they win this war. And this war is um, basically the likes of uh, the Palestinians, and Hamas, and Hezbollah, and Syria and parts of Jordan, all of them surrounding and in amongst Israel. And there's this initial inner ring war. In amongst all of that initial inner ring war, Damascus is completely destroyed. That ne has never happened. That will happen, God says in Isaiah 17. And Syria will come to an end as a functioning nation. That's also what it says. Israel in this inner ring war is going to be left um, victorious, but weakened, it says. So Israel wins this initial inner ring war. It's still to happen. And events, believe it or not, in Ukraine, I believe, will actually spur on this, this first event uh, happening. More of that in a second. The second stage, because imagine Israel wins, the pricking briars, as Ezekiel calls it, are removed, and Israel is living in a, in a sense of security and peace. For the first time, it's removed all of these pricking briars that surround them. And a great void is left in the Middle East. Syria has ceased to exist as a, as a functioning nation. Israel thinks they're at peace, but into that void pour the nations of Ezekiel chapter 38. And this is uh, also mentioned in Zechariah 14. So Zechariah 12 is a different event to Zechariah 14. For years, we thought it's all been exactly the same, and they're not. They're two different events. So Zechariah 14 uh, and Ezekiel 38 and the last half of Daniel 11 talks about this tsunami of nations that come in to Israel, into the void that's been left. And there's nine, na nine nations that are mentioned in Ezekiel 38 where this happens, and down they come. Now, Jesus we know is returned and judged by the time Russia comes down into Israel, don't we? Because when Jesus comes in Zechariah 14 to the Mount of Olives, he comes with who? The saints. So we know that the saints have been judged by the time Jesus comes in. But it still leaves, and there's a great judgment of all of those, and hordes and hordes of people are, 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 are killed, as we know, in that second stage. But that still doesn't answer the third stage. And the third stage is, what I believe is the third stage, is when Jesus is here on earth and in Jerusalem with the saints, there is a battle fought by a resurrected Holy Roman Empire. This is, this is Europe now coming against Christ and the saints. This is nothing to do with spoil, which is the driving factor of stage two. It's nothing to do with nearby neighbors, which is all to do with stage one. It's actually all to do with religion, which is stage three. And, and, therefore, and, and it tells you that actually, of course, in, Isaiah, in Revelation 17, because it says that the woman and the beast make war against the lamb and those that are with him who are called and chosen and faithful. Well, Russia isn't making war against the Lamb and against those who are called and chosen and faithful because we haven't arrived until they're, and, until they're already there in the Lamb. So this is a third stage. So I'm not saying everybody in the room is going to uh, think the same as me on this. I get that because we've all got slightly different views on how things work. But 
you know, been, I've been doing the World Watch since October 2003, and over time, this has crystallized in my mind, and now I've seen it, it's hard not to see it, if you know what I mean. Um, so stage one, Israel's relatives. Stage two is that Israel's riches, spoil. And stage three is that Israel's religion. And when those three things are sorted out, the kingdom can properly get underway. So we're going to uh, have a think about the events in Ukraine. And because I'm not in presenter mode, I don't quite remember what slides are coming up. So you're going to have to bear with me now. I'm trying to memorize about 50 slides. Um, but we've got a video that's going to be coming up. So we're going to play a few little videos that try and explain what's going on in relation to the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We're not looking at all the history of Ukraine. There's lots of brilliant Christophian videos that, that, that are looking at all of that. I'm not on this talk. What I'm looking at is what is the impact on Putin's invasion of Ukraine on those three things that we're expecting to happen? So let's have a little look at uh, what's going on. So the 24th of February, 2022, after many months of military buildup along the borders, something that was previously unthinkable to nearly everyone actually happened. Within Ukraine, the morning everywhere erupted with the sound of cruise missiles and artillery barrages as the Russian armed forces initiated their full-scale invasion of the country, prompting the largest military conflict between two nation states in Europe since the Second World War. Clashes followed a campaign of aerial bombardment. How can I, so we how knew can this I, was building up. There was Biden, Biden and lots of world leaders were saying, we can see it's going to happen. We think it's going to happen. And suddenly it explodes onto our screens. But watch this little clip coming up now. Should Putin's Russia manage to emerge victorious, it has the potential to completely upend the entire order of Europe. With the flurry of sanctions, travel bans, airspace restrictions, mass arrests within Russia, and more over the past few weeks, it truly appears that a new Iron Curtain is descending across the European continent, this time shifted over slightly to the east from where it was before, from Kaliningrad on the Baltic to the Ukrainian shores on the Black seeing, Sea. We're seeing Europe and Russia split absolutely apart. At the same time as all of this has been happening, another fascinating way that the world is changing before our eyes over this war can be seen in the air. Since the beginning of the war's outbreak, Ukrainian airspace has obviously been completely sealed off from the rest of the world, and international flights have all been avoiding it. But then, just a few days following the invasion and as part of their overall sanctions package, the European Union blocked all Russian airlines from flying over their airspace, followed up by similar declarations from Norway, Iceland, the UK, Canada, and the United States. In retaliation to these blockages, Russia also decided to ban the airlines of 36 countries from using their airspace, including all EU, British, Canadian, American, and Japanese airlines. As a result, Western airlines have largely stopped flying to Russia, while Russian airlines have largely stopped flying to the West. So while a physical Iron Curtain has yet to actually descend back across Europe on the ground, the Iron Curtain of the Air is already very much a new reality and again. Life flight radar maps well, are nobody's right now flying showing... to Russia. You know, what impact does this really have? But what is really interesting is that we can't we can't fly over Russia. So if you bought a ticket to fly from London to Tokyo and you bought it before the Ukraine invasion, and then you bought one after the Ukraine invasion, that flight would take you three hours longer because they can't go over Russian territory anymore. They've got to skirt all the way round, right round the top of Russia and back round again, which is quite interesting. So there's all this disruption of flights out to uh, the east, if you like, have come about. And apparently what we've got now happening is exactly what happened at the height of the Cold War because during the Cold War, that happened. Russia said no flights are coming over from the West over our country. And lo and behold, within days, we're back, we're back to that, which is really um, uh, interesting. Now, so I'm seeing 
really this division between Russia on the east and obviously uh, Belarus and some of Ukraine, we'll get on to that in a minute, and Europe, or the EU, we could say, on, on the west there. And, and interestingly, of course, if you go to Revelation 16, which we're not, because this is a massive topic just on its own, you'll read about the fact that there is a dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. And it says in the lead up to Armageddon, there's a dragon, a beast, and a false prophet. You're all aware of this, yeah, in Revelation 16. Well, the dragon is representative right the way through Revelation of the eastern part where Russia is now. And the beast, which crops up, we've already talked about the beast in Revelation 17, but the beast all the way through Revelation is talking about the Western Europe, or what we would call the EU. So isn't it interesting? God hasn't said all these get melded together in one big lump. They're still identifiable as two different things. And in fact, there's no more mention of the dragon. In fact, if you look at Revelation 17, there's no more dragon anymore. It's just talking about the beast. Why? Because the dragon's been dealt with in stage two. The beast, which is the EU bit, is stage three. That's when Jesus has come back. So what I'm looking for is a division between the West and the East, exactly as we are seeing. Um, so there is uh, stage two, which is the Russian invasion of Israel, and stage three, when Christ has returned and is established in Jerusalem, is the resurrected Holy Roman Empire with an army and, um, and, and equipment to come down and have a physical war. I know this might seem crazy. I mean, if it wasn't in Revelation 17, I probably wouldn't believe it myself, but it's there. And, the, and a, a, a resurrected Holy Roman Empire is going to make a re, have a religious war against the Lamb and the saints. But that is stage three. So effectively, what I'm seeing is the original Daniel's image with the, with the, with the two legs remains separated. So I'm not seeing a coming together or Russia taking over the whole of Europe or anything like that. I think what we're going to see is the opposite, that these are going to move further and further apart and have different agendas. But both of them will end up in Israel at different times. But among the greatest of changes ushered in by Putin's war in Ukraine is the revolution undergoing Germany, and specifically the German military and defense doctrine. During an incredible session of the German Bundestag just three days after the invasion, the new chancellor, Olaf Scholz, announced a series of earth-shattering measures. The German armed forces would receive a one-time $113 billion defense fund to rapidly modernize themselves and, from thereafter, would receive a permanent annual budget increase to more than 2% of Germany's annual GDP. This means that their yearly budget will be increased to around $78 billion, causing Germany's military to suddenly become the third best funded in the world, only behind China and America. And critically, that means they'll be ahead of Russia's military budget. Very rapidly, the German army will likely once again, for the first time in nearly a century, take over the reins of being the most formidable on the European continent. So Germany is about to become the, one of the largest military operations on the planet because of the amount of money that they've now said we're going to pour into military. Why? Because of Russia. Not to join forces with Russia, to protect themselves against Russia. But we're expecting to see Germany become a powerhouse again, military-wise, because they're going to have to, they, they will, as a resurrected Holy Roman Empire, take on Jesus when he returns. Have a listen to this. Don't listen to this. <laughs> so basically, what the impact of Ukraine within weeks is enormous. Germany is now committed to an army beyond anything that it would ever have considered because of the, the Holocaust and all those things that happened 70 years ago. They would never wanted to get back into military. They're now forced to. And their spending, as we've just read, is, is rocketing up uh, to enormous uh, levels. So that, to me, answers stage three. I know it's some way down the track, that, but you can see the impact of Ukraine 
on Europe, the West, I should say, the EU coming together, because it won't just be Germany. Other EU states are going to pour money in, into weapons and develop an EU army, un undoubtedly. And most unexpectedly of all, they've even agreed to indefinitely suspend the Nord Stream 2 pipeline project that would have brought in even more enormous quantities of natural gas directly from the vast sources of Siberia and Russia. The cost to build this controversial pipeline was more than $11 billion. And so, of course, such a move will be difficult for the German economy to bear. But such is their resolve in showing solidarity with Ukraine. This is all quite unexpected and unprecedented because right up until the actual invasion, Germany was hesitant to actually support Ukraine and come out hard against Russia because Germany is critically over-dependent on Russian natural gas, even without the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. With limited domestic energy resources of their own, Germany has had no other choice but to import nearly the entirety of her energy needs from abroad. And with some of the largest natural gas and oil reserves in the world, geographically nearby Russia has always been the most significant provider. Through a complex series of pipelines that have been constructed over decades sprawling out from the vast oil and gas fields in Siberia, Russia directly provides Germany with a third of her oil and half of her natural gas. And the same is true for much of the rest of Europe as well. Italy and France also import significant amounts of Russian fossil fuels. And the closer eastwards the countries are to Moscow, the more fossil fuels they generally import. To the point where many nations like Bosnia, North Macedonia, Macedonia, Moldova, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Croatia, Czechia, and Austria import nearly the entirety of their gas from Russia. This is largely because, geologically, the European continent was not blessed with large amounts of oil or natural gas that power the modern engines of civilization. And instead, large amounts of these resources can be found all around the European Union's perimeter, in the North Sea between the UK and Norway, across the Euro mountains in Russian Siberia, in the eastern Mediterranean around Cyprus, Israel, and Egypt, and of course around the Persian it's Gulf. Amazing. So Germany would, was hooking up and is hooked up to Russia to get all this gas and has cancelled this billions of pounds worth of pipeline that was going to give them even more gas. And Germany's turned around and, and halted any gas coming through that brand new pipeline. But isn't it also interesting that on this um, description of what's going on, Here's other pockets of major energy supplies. And did you hear them say Israel? Because Israel in recent years has made some of the largest gas finds anywhere in the world. The Leviathan um, gas fields just off the coast of, uh, of, of Israel. So suddenly what we've got is, is uh, the EU wanting to stop relying on Russia for energy. And just have a watch of this confront Moscow's aggression. In order to overcome this dependency in energy insecurity, the European Commission has, since the invasion, outlined a 10-point proposal to make the EU completely independent from Russian fossil fuels by the end of the decade. A 10-point plan by the end of the decade for the EU to have no uh, gas coming in from Russia. I mean, that is absolutely earth-shattering from a you imagine Putin's getting all these billions of rubles or dollars coming in and suddenly because of what he's doing and the aggression that he's showing, the whole of the West is looking for every way to stop trading with him for energy. Now, this is a geopolitical nightmare, isn't it, that you can see building up uh, in, in the world. So what I'm suggesting to you is happening is this. There's this great splitting away of the West from the East and literally rupturing pipelines in the process. But what is, um, well, here's a headline, um, because one of the interesting things is, of course, that Putin, some have said, might keep pushing, pushing out towards and take over parts of Europe. I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, you know something? He's even struggled to take the northern part of Ukraine, hasn't it? He got, to Kiev, uh, he got to Kiev and just stopped. He couldn't get through. And we'll look at that if we get time in just a second as to the significance of Ukraine and which bit he's aiming 
hoping for and which bit is leaving behind. So I don't think he could possibly, not without throwing nuclear weapons at everybody and destroying everything, which I don't think he's going to uh, do, because that brings Russia to an end as well. He cannot move further uh, and take over this whole area. He'd get swamped. He can't even do it in Ukraine itself uh, at the moment. Now, the other interesting thing is that, as I've already said, Israel has, has found enormous gas fields. And here's an, a headline just from a few days ago. Russia-Ukraine war, conflict boosts hopes for East Mediterranean energy, experts say. Israeli foreign minister said Russia's invasion will change the structure of the European and Middle East and energy markets. Well, of course it will, because e the EU is now looking for new energy. And there's Israel sat there. And I've put a pipeline there. That's not real. That's just made up. But there is actually plans for a pipeline coming out of Israel to go straight into southern Europe. And you can imagine that this is all systems go now to, to make this happen. But what does Russia, I wonder, think to this? So it's losing all of its, uh, its it, it can't sell like it used to into, into the West. And lo and behold, this little upstart country down here called Israel starts supplying and making the money that it's now losing. Is this going to wind Russia up? It's going to completely do Putin mind in that Israel, Israel can't answer the whole of the EU's uh, gas needs, by the way, but just the fact that they're plugging in to uh, tap and, and help the EU with energy while they cut Russia off because we don't like what Russia's doing is massive. And I, you, you know, it says in the Bible that uh, God will put hooks in uh, Gog's jaws and bring him down uh, to take a spoil. Well, surely this is a massive driving factor uh, to do exactly that. So on the back of Ukraine, we know that Russia in stage two is going to come down to take a spoil. And on the back of Ukraine, I think Russia's eyes will turn vehemently towards Israel if Israel does start, start supplying the EU with, with gas. And so that is his motivation to take that over. Why should that little country have taken away some of our um, energy supplies and we'll just go down and take it? I think that's exactly what is, is, is on the cards. And none of this is to even mention the unprecedented and enormous sanctions that Western countries are pouring onto Russia, which will have devastating financial impacts on every Russian citizen for years or even decades to come. Further, I haven't even mentioned the dozens upon dozens of Western companies that have announced their pullouts from the Russian market. Like, most symbolically of all, McDonald's who was among one of the very first Western companies allowed to open a store in Moscow back in 1990, when it was still a part of the Soviet Union. In the 30 years since then, McDonald's and Russia have built and developed an incredibly close relationship, with around 850 locations across the country that provide around 10% of McDonald's's entire worldwide revenue. But then, in a matter of days, Putin's invasion of Ukraine completely wiped out what it took the company more than three decades to build, as McDonald's announced that the company would be closing all of their locations throughout the country. And the same story is true of dozens of other companies, from Ikea to Adidas to Netflix to Visa to Sony and so many others. The list is seriously enormous. Is isn't it? So it's not just the gas, all these companies are pulling out of Russia. Can you imagine them going back in in the short term or even the medium term? So this is having a major, major financial crisis now, which hasn't even uh, come over the lines yet. They reckon that Russia, Russia in the next few weeks will have to default on its debt. And that will be enormous if it does. And it will have to because it hasn't got the cash reserves anymore that it can access like it did uh, previously. So Russia is in a serious financial crisis. But what is amazing about that, of course, is that John Thomas wrote about Russia uh, in Alpes Israel 150 or so years ago and said, let the Russian treasury be as empty as it's said to be and its expenditure exceed its revenue by double the alleged deficit. I mean, that's fancy language to say, let them run out of money. 
it will only operate as a pressure from within, causing her autocrat, he's referencing Gog there, to enter into the countries and to overflow and pass over and to enrich himself with the spoil of those he's destined to subdue. I mean, it's amazing that he saw that. And it's amazing that we're seeing it playing out right in front of our eyes because of Ukraine. So Ukraine is opening up all this situation, uh, you know, in, in, in lots of different spheres. Oh, before I play this video, um, the next bit I just wanted to show you is how this could impact on stage one, all right? So if you think we've said actually what's happened so far is that it's, it's actually impacting stage three, it's actually impacting stage two. Stage one, of course, is the initial inner ring war around Israel that I said to you. And you might say, well, how on earth do events in Ukraine have any impact on an, in, an initial inner ring war around Israel? But in Psalm 83, there's something very interesting because it tells you about these nine tribes that are all based around Israel that all, all launch an attack against Israel. But there's a 10th one that's mentioned, which isn't a tribe, it's a nation. And it's the nation of Asher. And that is a reference, I believe, to Iran. In other words, there's a power behind the throne of all these people that, that surround Israel. There's a power behind the throne. And that power behind the throne that is steering all of these people to rise up is Iran. And of course, we know, don't we, that Iran has got proxy armies and its proxy armies are Hamas and Hezbollah and Syria as a nation. And it controls what they do and when they do it. So how does the U Ukrainian situation impact on Iran, which might then impact on Israel? We'll have a look at this. Negotiators are closing in on the terms to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. Both the U.S. and Iran appear committed to securing the agreement in the days and weeks ahead. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has only intensified the negotiation process. However, Russian officials overseeing the negotiations are hampering the talks. They claim the West sanctions on Moscow are creating problems with the deal. So for more on this, let's bring in Henry Rome. He is the deputy head of research and the director of global macro politics and the Middle East at Eurasia Group. Henry, thank you so much for being with us. So how is the ongoing war in Ukraine impacting these nuclear talks between the U.S., Iran and whatever part Russia has in these talks? Well, it's really throwing a last minute wrench into the negotiation. The negotiators, um, by all accounts, were within days of locking down the revival of this agreement uh, when the, the Russians came out over the weekend throwing some new demands on the table, such that if U.S. sanctions on Iran are lifted through the agreement, the Russians want to ensure that they're able to benefit from that as well. And of course, they are under a series of crippling Western sanctions um, for their invasion of Ukraine. So it's really thrown a um, thrown a lot of uncertainty into the talks and created a lot of questions about the longevity uh, of these negotiations. Given all that, can this deal be... So that's interesting, isn't it? So behind all of this, the negotiations with Iran have suddenly had a wrench chucked into them because of uh, Russia saying, hold on a minute, we're not going to allow this deal to go through. So now the tension is building, and it's, if you look for it in the press, it's there. But obviously Ukraine dominates everything. But if you start looking uh, for stuff that's in relation to Iran, it, the tension is building there, and something's going to snap with that. And at some point, I believe Iran will, will fight back and uh, get its own way if it possibly can. And it does that by causing trouble elsewhere. And it will do that stage one tells us by uh, activating its proxy armies that live in and around um, Israel. Now we know Iran does that, but Iran survives because it ends up joining Russia in stage two. So it's almost like it's playing its pawns in, uh, around Israel, but then joins Russia uh, as a nation in stage two. So hopefully some of that makes uh, some sense, but clearly we can see so much is going on. Normal times, Ukraine. Let me, yeah, so let me just show you this because this is just something I'm just throwing in there because this is amazing. Um, and what impact this will have on the world, uh, we can only surmise, have a look at this. Normal times, Ukraine is the world's fifth largest exporter of wheat. 
and during 2020, they exported more than 18 million tons of it to countries across the world, but most importantly, to hungry countries across the Middle East and North Africa. 60% of Lebanon's wheat supply just prior to the war was being shipped in from Ukraine. And since their most major grain silos were all blown up back in 2020 during the Beirut port explosion, they only have one month worth of wheat reserves still remaining as of the writing of this video, and they're in an extremely dire situation. Meanwhile, Egypt, with a population of more than 100 million people to feed, and with scarce agricultural land of their own, is the world's largest importer of wheat. And an overwhelming 85% of their wheat imports come from just two places, Ukraine and Russia, who are currently at war. Remember the Arab Spring when that happened? They put a lot of it down to food shortages and, and people uh, took to the streets in huge numbers. And this hasn't even begun to impact yet, but is it going to impact? Of course it is. Do you think the Ukrainian farmers are out there merrily uh, collecting wheat in or sowing it and going out with tractors? Do you think they can get it to the ports when Russia's taken over the whole lot and destroyed their major ports that they've, that, that, that they've done? This is enormous. And Lebanon, just north of Israel, is seriously impacted by this. And as that report said, I've only got a month, a week or two supply left of grain left in the country. Where do you suddenly find this levels of quantity uh, of wheat really, really difficult? Um, again, John Thomas said, when Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things at present constituted is at hand. The long expected but stealthy, stealthily advent of the King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming fact. So we can see Russia suddenly bursting, it, uh, bursting the banks, pushing out in super uh, ag aggressive ways. And this picture probably says it all. And um, down south, it will ultimately uh, come and into the Middle East. Um, have I got another few minutes? I don't know. Are you, are you okay for a bit? We, we, it's probably started 10 minutes late, in fairness. <laughs> I try and grab every spare minute I can. Um, I want to show you something interesting, right? So I want to talk to you a little bit about... Um, so we all know these two passages, Ezekiel 38 and Daniel 11. And it says in Ezekiel 38, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And it goes on and says the nations that are going to be with Gog, and they're going to come from the north, it's going to be in the latter years. They're going to come against the mountains of Israel. We know this. Um, and they come down and take a spoil. And the parallel passage is over there in Daniel 11, which we'll, we'll look at in just a second. But the key bit is, of course, that Gog is of the land of Magog. So first of all, who or what is Gog? Well, Gog was a title of the person who ran the Magogites. So you might have a country that has a king. You might have a country that has a pharaoh. You might have a, a country that has a president. Um, but this particular country of Magog had as its rule as somebody called Gog. It means somebody that's all puffed up like a mountain. That's what basically it is. And that's what they called. All the leaders of Magog were called Gog. So Gog was a real person. And it could vary as leaders came and went. But Gog was a real and historical person. In fact, that's exactly what it says by this historian here. Gog, king of Magog, was originally a real and historical person, none other, in fact, than chief of the Scythians. So in this uh, book on history, they're saying that Magog is the same as Scythia. That's what they're saying. And this isn't the only history book that tells you that. But Gog uh, became renowned and uh, survived as a byword for terror in later generations. So where is Scythia? And interestingly, Josephus, that we've all heard about, uh, again, uh, a very ancient historian, writes, Magog founded those that from him were named Magogites, but who by the Greeks are called the Scythians. So there's another historian saying, if you want to look at Magog, find a map of Scythia. So I go on Google, I type in Scythia, because now I know I'm looking at Magog, and lo and behold, that's what I see. 
Now you might say, where is this? Well, you can, you, you can see that the bulk of Scythia covers Southern Russia. So Gog of the land of Magog is basically the leader of Southern Russia. But here is something that is mind blowing. Well, I think this is mind blowing. Watch the screen here because I'm gonna superimpose on the map, Ukraine. Now, isn't that interesting? So half of ancient Magog covered the eastern part of current Ukraine. And in fact, if you go on the BBC tonight and type in Ukraine and the political maps and all the rest of it, you'll see that sort of funny blob. Now, what that funny blob is, is showing you the different languages that people speak in Ukraine at the moment. And anything in yellow or light yellow, they speak Russian predominantly. Anything in pink or red, they speak Ukrainian. And you remember Putin's play on saying, we're, we're, we're rescuing our, our dear beloved Russian friend. He's blowing them as the smithereens, but he's saying they're all Russian speaking and that's why we're going in. It's not a great argument because you could, we could say, well, we're gonna go over there and take over uh, America because they speak English, you know, it doesn't really add up. But that's, his, that's his, what his brain's saying. Now, I'm not saying Putin's going into this area of Ukraine because he's looking on a map thinking I'm taking over ancient Scythia. But isn't it incredible that those two maps are identical? And in fact, of course, what Putin has now said is that I'm not, I can't take the northern bit of the country after all, the west and the north. I've got, I'm pulling out of Kyiv. He hasn't said that in so many words, but his defence ministers have. And they said, we're pulling out of Kyiv. And what we're going to do is take over the east. In other words, they're going to concentrate on the very bit that was originally Mago. Isn't that incredible? I mean, that's mind blowing. This is when, it, when God says he's Gog of the land of Mago, the final piece of Mago is currently underway, being filled in in terrible ways by the aggressor, the terror that is, that is Putin. I find that absolutely uh, amazing. We also know where Meshach and Tubal are, they're up in the uh, north, further north into Russia. So really, the description of Mago, Meshach and Tubal covers, absolutely covers modern day Russia. What I don't think is that Mago has anything whatsoever to do with Germany. I just don't think it's anything whatsoever to do with Germany. That's another topic to, you know, to look at that. But what I believe is, and in fact, John Thomas said this in Alpha's Israel in a number of books, You've got to look at where the people were when Ezekiel wrote. What land did they live in at that time? And that's precisely the land that they were in at that time. If you try and track where people moved to, well, Israel is now in New York. <coughs> you can't do it. Um, so this is what Ezekiel 38 looks like pretty much, although now I could probably add in half of Ukraine to fill the picture of ancient Mago. But there's... Uh, Mago, Meshach, Tubal and Rosh up there. There's Togomar and Goma, which I don't think is anything to do with the, the, the EU in the West. It's all to do with the area around Turkey. Persia is modern day Iran. Libya is Libya. And Ethiopia is around Ethiopia and Sudan. And this, these are the nations that come in in stage two. You notice not a single solitary one of them border Israel itself because the inner ring war has already happened and Israel has succeeded in the inner ring war. And Syria has been taken out as a nation at this point. And so into the void come all those dark colored nations and partly it's because of spoil. So you've got to say therefore that the current leader of Russia is Vladimir Putin. That makes him go as we stand here right now. And I truly believe this is the man. And what I want to do for the last sort of five or 10 minutes, if you give me that time, is demonstrate to you that Putin is go. And if it isn't him, it's got to be somebody that's identical as him. Absolutely identical. And there's some real nuances about this in the Bible that I'm going to show you uh, very quickly. We know he's going to think an evil thought to come down and take a spoil out of Israel. All right. So let's quickly do this. Now, I don't know why I'd never seen this before, but now I've seen it. I can't unsee it either. 
So in Ezekiel 38, you've got the description of where Gog lives. Yeah, that's what we've just looked at. Happy with that? But in Daniel chapter 11, it's the parallel passage. And if uh, you can see all the colors line up, there's pink and greens and reds and blues and yellows. They are all the same phrases. It's the same account in Daniel 11. Uh, but Daniel 11 talks about a king that exists at the time of the end. So from verse 36 to 39, it says the king will do according to his will and other things. And it says at the time of the end, the king of the north will come against him like a whirlwind. So this king of verse 36 to 39 exists at the time of the end. This is a living, breathing human being. It's not a nation, it's a man. And what I suddenly realized was, and why it took me a decade to work it out, I do not know, but I suddenly realized that the that Gog in these two verses here, telling us where he lives, is exactly the same king of verse 36 to 39 that doesn't tell you where he lives. It tells you what, he, what he's like. It tells you the sort of character that he is. Would you like to have a quick look at this? This is verse 36 to 39. This is the king that exists at the time of the end. And it says these incredible words, and all of them are about Gog. And I'm saying Gog is a Russian leader, and Putin is the Russian leader. So listen to this. The king shall do according to his will, and he will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and speak marvellous things against the god of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined should be done. Neither is he going to regard the God of his fathers or the desire of women, nor, the, nor regard any God, for he will magnify himself above all. But in his estate, he will honor the God of forces, that's munitions or armies. And a God whom his fathers knew not will he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do, the word means work, in the most stronghold with a strange God, who he will acknowledge and increase with glory, and he will cause them to rule over many and divide the land for a gain. Modern version says in that last sentence, he will honour those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority and divides the land among them as their reward. And at the time of the end, the king of the south pushes at him. Living, breathing, real person, go. Now, if you take every single one of those phrases, it fits like a hand into a glove with Vladimir Putin, who is currently Gog, ruling over Magog, Meshach, and Tubal. Does he magnify himself? You know, that group there, it, uh, uh, Putin's got his own youth movement in Russia where they worship Putin. This is on tens of thousands of young people. Uh, they, that's Putin on their T-shirts, by the way. And Nashi means, and they're called the Nashis, which is interesting, but it means in Russia, our choice. And they're trained and indoctrinated about, about this man. There is no other world leader like Vladimir Putin. Action man. Man of the people. And ruler of Russia. Vladimir Putin приветствует экипаж морского транспорта. From Ukraine to Syria, Vladimir Putin's influence is being felt. He's faced countless accusations of corruption, but still has record of approval ratings. I should say. Mikhail Gorbachev said a few years ago that Vladimir Putin views himself as second only to God. He's magnified himself in his heart. It says that he worships the god of forces or munitions. This is exactly what Putin has done. He's transformed the Russian military, poured billions and billions of dollars into it. I know they're struggling, but believe me, they have, they, they, if they wanted to, they could throw a lot more uh, and probably will at some point at uh, Ukraine. Let's skip that video. <laughs> The other thing is, it says that this king worships gold, silver, and it says something like, um, uh, what's the word? Something like, in one version, something like pleasant gifts or precious gifts or something like that, it says. So he loves gold and silver and goods. 
And recently, there was this headline, Vladimir Putin, is he the richest man in the world? Because he's siphoned off so much cash, they reckon he's richer than Bill Gates. And in fact, that article on the right there that you can see was in the Times yesterday. Vladimir Putin's love of luxury from designer watches to laboratory brushes, and you read it, and they're made of gold. It's absolutely incredible. On the shore of the Black Sea, it can only be described as a palace, 190,000 square feet. From the air, you can see the church, tea house, and amphitheater, and reportedly an underground hockey rink with a no-fly zone and a no-boat zone. This, according to an investigation last year by the jailed Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's group, they claim that this gilded, luxurious palace fit for a king was built for Vladimir Putin. This palace is very much a symbol and a miniature of Putin's Russia. He no longer sees himself as a government employee, as an elected figure. He sees himself as a Tsar, as a king. Interesting. You know when it says that he works in a stronghold? He is the only world leader to work in a stronghold because the Kremlin means a citadel or a stronghold. There is no other world leader that works in a stronghold. And God says this leader will work in a stronghold. Kremlin equals stronghold. It's the Russian word for stronghold. It's amazing detail. The last bit I'm just going to show you here is this, and this is mind blowing because it was on Panorama uh, a couple of years ago, because what it says, the last thing that we're told about him is that he will honor those who submit to him, appointing them to positions of authority, and he divides the land among them as their reward. Now watch this. <coughs> He's the world leader accused of personally approving murder on the streets of London. The conclusion that the Russian state was probably involved in the murder of Mr. Litvinenko is deeply disturbing. But is the president implicated in an assassination also responsible for theft on an extraordinary scale? He has fleets of things that almost no billionaire in the West would have. Vladimir Putin has been accused of looting his own country. Today, Putin behaves like a czar. Tonight, we investigate the truth about President Putin's riches. Why would it be kept secret? Because it belongs personally to Putin, not to the state. And for the first time, the Americans say what they really think about the Russian president. Is Vladimir Putin corrupt? In our view, yes. The men closest to Putin have been with him for years. They were with him here in St. Petersburg and they've stayed with him ever since. And this is the group that he trusts and that he rewards. And this is the group that runs Russia. Putin's lawyer at the town hall became president and then prime minister of Russia. His former deputy also served as prime minister. The chief of staff at the town hall now runs Russia's anti-drugs agency. His former assistant now runs the biggest oil company in the world. And his former economist now runs the biggest gas company in the world. For those who've been in Putin's circle, the benefits have been immense. A cellist who is godfather to Putin's daughter has a valuable stake in a major Russian bank. A neighbor has an even bigger stake. Another neighbor ended up running the railways. A childhood friend has made a fortune from government contracts. And his brother has made even more. The Americans say this is how Putin's Russia works. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? Because what did it say? It said he would divide the land among them as a reward, those who submit to him. And that's, it's unbelievable detail. But he's going to come to his end. I mean, people are saying, is he going to get shot? Is somebody going to take him out? Is, is it going to be an uprising? The answer, I think, is no. 
Because if he is go, and if he isn't, it's got to be somebody else that ticks all those things. Then if he is, then his end is coming like this. It says, I will punish you, Gog, and your armies with the disease and bloodshed. I will send torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and burning sulfur, says God at the end of Ezekiel 38. It says in Daniel 11 that he will stop between the gl glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. And while he's there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will help him. He's going to come to a supernatural end, not be taken out by, by the people. If God is right, then we're right in calling him out as to, to who he is. Uh, the very last slide I want to show you is this, because it says at the time of the end, the king of the south will push at this map. And you say, well, who is the king of the south? We know this is Go, this is Putin. So at the time of the end, the king of the south pushes at Putin. So who's the king of the south? And the king of the south, brothers and sisters, is the US and UK. Because you get that out of Ezekiel chapter 38, because of Tarshish and the young lions. So what is the word push? The word push is the Hebrew word to gore. Um, and basically, it's a military provocation. <coughs> so basically, what you've got is the king of the south militarily provoking Gog. That is what it's saying. And so if the king of the south is Britain and America, we're looking for a provocation, a military provocation against that man. And believe it or not, of course, in Ukraine, that's exactly what is happening. So the UK is sending more of these um, devastating missiles that are seriously aggravating uh, Russia and their, and their defense because they're taking out the tanks. And Boris Johnson is leading the way in this um, push against Putin. And Putin has said and singled out Britain as, as a nation that is pushing against him. Look at that headline. UK sends 6,000 more missiles to Ukraine in Johnson push to keep the flame of freedom alive. Fire. For the Russian military in Ukraine, it's become a fearsome adversary. Well, these are the next generation light anti-tank weapon or NLAW as they're known. They're a uh, shoulder mounted portable fire and forget missile uh, with a range of up to 800 meters. Now the UK has supplied 2000 of these to the Ukrainian forces and it's these that are proving so effective against Russian armor. So there we are. I've gone on quite a bit. If you want to get the world watch, if you're not registered for it, it looks like Putin's pointing to you there, telling you to register, but that isn't, that isn't really what it meant. Um, but it's all happening. And I know we're going to have different perspectives on things and people who have different views, but surely we're all in agreement that Russia is key. Russia's got a role to play. Putin looks like he fits hand into a glove into these verses and surely on the brink of momentous things continuing to happen this year. Sorry I've gone on a little bit longer, but hopefully there's some food for thought in amongst all of that.